Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Living Without Judging, Dr. McLuhan explains why Jesus instructed his followers not to judge people. A young man walked into a church, and no sooner had he passed through the doors when he heard the pastor say from the pulpit, a young man just walked into this house. You are a holy man. There's a great anointing on your life, and God is going to use you around the world for his kingdom. After the service was over, people who knew the young man came up to the pastor. They were disturbed. They said, Pastor, you got it wrong. I know that man. He's addicted to cocaine. How could you say something like that about him? The preacher said, I knew that, and the man knew that. What he does not know is how God sees him and what he's going to do for his life. During the service, the man was instantly set free from cocaine and began his journey towards life with Jesus. And this story illustrates why it is so important that we understand what Jesus said to us in this saying, do not judge and you will not be judged. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. What a remarkable story. It's a funny thing. But this saying of Jesus seems to be one of the most quoted statements by people who do not follow Jesus. Have you ever had people say that to you? People who are not following Jesus frequently accuse those of us who are following Jesus of judging them or being judgmental. And that's reason enough for us to explore this important saying. Now Luke expands on what Matthew wrote in his gospel of Jesus saying by saying this, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others and, or it will come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Luke chapter 6 and verse 37. If you've ever felt judged by someone, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The saying of Jesus is part of the message that we've come to know as the famous Sermon on the Mount. And in this message, Jesus presented the principles of what he called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus taught his followers to think the way God thinks. The statement is not about, about judging needs to be understood in the context of the whole message that Jesus presented. Uh, everyone, every day, is required to make decisions. We call this good judgment. We commend people who have good judgment about, and we see this in the way they speak, in the, way, the places they go, and in the things that they do. So what does exactly does Jesus mean when he says, do not judge? Jesus is teaching that there's a kind of judging that is destructive. And this is what Jesus is warning us about in these verses. And how do we know the difference? And there are four marks of judging that is destructive. Let me suggest a few of these to you. When it is personal, when our judging is personal, and not through proper channels, channels of authority that God has established, such as the courts, and when we act as though we are both the judge and the jury. How many of you have seen old movies where somebody's arrested and the, and the judge says, I'm the, both the judge and the jury, <laughs> and you don't have any choice but what I decide. And when we take the desire for punishment into our own hands, and we want to do things to people, and of course when we try to seek revenge, we are, that's the kind of judgment that leads us into trouble. Remember these words, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Aren't you so glad to know that nobody ever gets away with anything, maybe for a short period of time, but eventually we'll all stand before the righteous judge. So this kind of judging brings negative consequences into our lives. Here are three consequences that I think are important for us to think about this morning. We bring 
more judgment upon ourselves. When we judge people this way, it results in more judging being directed towards us. Jesus said, for you will be treated, treat others the way you want to be treated. The standard you use in judging is the standard which will be used to judge you. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 2. And we read in Galatians about the relationship between what we sow spiritually and what we reap in the spirit. Of course, uh, Paul is speaking about the normal process of agriculture. What we sow, we reap, and so it is true in the spiritual realm. Do not be deceived. Paul wrote, God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. When we sow a judgment against someone, we end up reaping a consequence in our own lives. For example, judgment sown by a man against his mother will most likely be reaped in his wife or in relationships with women. This has been seen over and over again as we talk to couples. Judgments sown by a woman against her father are most likely to be reaped in her husband or in relationships with men in the offices of counseling or filled with questions of, of repeat behaviors because of judgments that have been made. A second consequence, it's too easy to make an error in judgment or judgments in error because we don't have all the facts that we need. How many of you had made a decision about someone only to say, ah, oh, if I had just known this about him or that about her, I would have had a different thought. So we find very clear teaching about this in the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light things that are now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. This is a powerful verse with deep insight. Because God knows things about people that you and I don't know. And God understands people in a way that you and I don't understand because he knows what their circumstances were. You're familiar with that. If you'd walk a, ma a mile in a man's shoes, you would know more about his circumstances. And so uh, Jesus says, just be careful because you don't know everything that's going on in this person's life. And we increase the possibility of doing the very same thing that we are condemning. Uh, so often when accusations are made against me, I'm aware of immediately in the spirit of something that's going on in that person's life. In Romans we read, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Have you found that things that you hate the most in other people are actually the things that you hate about them being in your own life? So here's a valuable lesson. Whenever people accuse you of doing things, it is often an indicator of exactly what they themselves are doing. This will serve you well and help you as you respond to people. For this reason, bringing accusations against others. Do it very cautiously. This is exactly what Jesus was warning us about. Now, over the years, some people have seemed to think it is their calling in life to tell me what's wrong with me or with this church. It's often things like that happen to pastors. And I've uh, never heard anything I didn't already know. Now, believe me, I know what's wrong. I'm not saying I know everything about every person. Some people like to come and talk about persons. I may not know that. But when they say, this is what's wrong with the church, nobody, and I never went, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> that didn't happen. Because God's already spoken to me. God's already helped me understand. I know what the weaknesses are, but what God sees when he sees Ingleside, that's what we need to see. We open our eyes to see what God sees and what God is doing. Every one of Jesus' disciples had flaws. And most leaders would not have picked the ones that Jesus picked. Jesus saw something in them that the other rabbis of the day did not see. 
It needs to be clear to us. Every single son is, aspires to be the student of a rabbi. Everyone. And anyone who was not a rabbi's student was rejected. And Jesus chose the ones who were rejected. They were not already in rabbinic school. They were in the secular trades. And so Jesus saw something in them that the other rabbis didn't see. I wrote a message called, What Did Jesus See in Levi? And you remember that message? I'm telling you, it's one of the most uh, popular messages I ever brought. I encourage you, if you've not heard that message or seen it, you can find it by searching my YouTube channel under Dr. Peter McLuhan and just search for, What Did Jesus See in Levi? Now, Jesus continued this teaching by saying, Why and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Matthew chapter 5, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses th uh, 3 through 5. Now, one way to live without judging is to free ourselves from hurtful experiences and judgments that we have made against people as we were growing up. We have seen, Pastor Margaret and I have seen many people help by working through these simple steps. Identify painful experiences that open the door for you to judge someone. <clears throat> this uh, takes time to slow down. Sometimes we are so busy masking our pain that we haven't actually identified what the source of that sorrow and hurt is in our life. And if you can find a person with whom you can safely express how hurt or how angry you felt as a result of this experience, it will help you. Uh, we know as, a, as an adult that we need to forgive. We have heard Jesus speak about this, but the child inside of us is still raging, and that child needs to express his or her frustration let it out in the presence of someone who is safe, who can help you. Give your hurt and your anger to Jesus. Lay your hurt at the foot of the cross. And then forgive the person, not as an adult, not as something that you are supposed to do, but from your heart as a child, just say, I release you and I put you in the hands of God. Ask God to reveal something to you about that person that you could not possibly know about. And as we have worked through this process, we have seen so many people who discovered something about the person that hurt them that increased their ability to have compassion on that one, to see your perpetrator through the eyes of his or her hurtful experiences. Nail your judgment to the cross of Christ. And when we do that, uh, Jesus places himself between us and reaping on that judgment that we have sown. And he takes the consequence and lifts it off of our lives. Release the person you have judged into God's hands. Just say, God, I give him to her. I put him or her in your hands. Sometimes in counseling with people, I'll just put my hands out and say, put your hands on top of my hands. And when you leave that person in God's hands, just lift your hands off of mine. And so many people have trembled and shaken and cried and then lifted their hands and just felt a flood of the peace of God come upon their life as I have taken their pain in my hands and nailed it to the cross of Christ. When we do this, we take ourselves out of the position of being judge over that person. And we've seen many people set free from old wounds who follow these simple steps. Now... What can we take away from the saying of Jesus? First of all, let God be God. Remember these words of Jesus. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Resist the urge to assign blame or motives to the actions of others which you disapprove. 
That's what gets us in the most trouble, and I feel often the most hurt as a pastor when people tell me what my motive was in what I did and completely miss my heart. My heart might have been in the right place, even if my action was not the wise, wisest thing to do. And so it's the heart. It is out of the heart that the issues of life flow. We want for your heart to be protected and held in the hands of Jesus so that when your heart is misunderstood, even if I have misunderstood your heart, you will feel safe in the hands of Jesus. Defer all judgment to Jesus because he knows things that we don't know. Leave the heavy lifting to Jesus. Only he knows why people do what they do. Become a recipient of the extra grace by lavishly sowing grace into the lives of all people. And these great words, judge not that you do not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. And so Jesus invites us to sow a cup of grace. Here is his promise. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You will be forgiven. <clears throat> you see, God knows how to take a cup of grace and bring back into our lives a bushel of mercy. And people today who have been crushed by the recklessness of others, there is a bushel of of mercy in your life. Uh, see, God sees you as beautiful and powerful. He's raising you up today. So give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap for the measure that you use will be measured back to you. Who wants to receive a, a bushel of mercy and grace in our lives today? And God is pouring out that grace into people's lives. God sees you as beautiful and powerful. God is raising you up today. Now, the Bible is full of stories of people who appeared, for whom, to whom God appeared, and changed the course of their life. When Nathaniel was introduced by his friend Philip, and when he intro Philip introduced Jesus to Nathaniel, he judged all the people who lived in the town of Nazareth. You remember the saying, don't you? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Uh, there was, was a judgment that Philip has made about the people who lived there, and sometimes we make judgments about people who live in certain places. Jesus turned, to Na turned Nathaniel around by calling him good. He said, there's nothing good. And Jesus said, Nathaniel, you are good. And saying that he saw him sitting under his fig tree. And of course, Nathaniel, when Nathaniel was undone by this word of knowledge that Jesus had about him. You see, Jesus always sees what we don't see in people. That simple revelation transformed Nathaniel into a new man. Last night, God showed me a man in a red shirt. I don't see any men in the house in a red shirt today, so you must be online if you're watching. God saw you last night. He showed you to me last night. If that's you, God is, says a change is coming. He's about to fulfill the desire of your heart. When Saul was on the road to Damascus, Jesus encountered him as a man in a bright, shining white robe. He changed him into the Apostle Paul and sent him all the way to Rome to share his faith with Emperor Nero himself. In preparing for this message, I listened to some words of destiny that were spoken over me back in 2018. And many of those words that Isabel said, it's on YouTube. If you're curious to know, I can show you how to find it. And I listened to it. She prophesied over Pastor Margaret and I for about 18 minutes. It was the most stunning thing that we would ever received. And she, she said things that would just have been so true in our lives. And one of the things that uh, she said, that you have endurance, you are a long-distance runner in the kingdom. Isn't that a word that's plainly, apparently obvious of being here 38 years? She didn't have any idea how long I had been here. And she just understood 
So she gave us a word that God knows how long we've run and he knows what the journey is about. At a low moment, when someone had cursed me and cursed the ministry and cursed the church, that's when that word came. You have endurance, so you are a distance runner in the kingdom of God. We thank the Lord that a word can turn us around. Ask God to move you from judging people to speaking words of hope and healing to, in their lives in desperate moments. Perhaps like the man in the first story, you're addicted to drugs and you're masking your pain. And perhaps I'm speaking to someone right now uh, who is in that exact situation. Jesus sees in you more than you ever thought possible. I break your addiction right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or any other device that's just got you in its grip. I break it now. And I speak over you the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus given by the Holy Spirit. Except that Jesus died for you in your place on the cross. And that you will spend eternity with God in heaven. Thank Jesus for dying for you and ask him to forgive you of all of your sins that you have committed through the course of your life. Now Holy Spirit come and fill people listening to this message. Fill us here in the house and fill us those that are watching in the stream. Open your eyes to see what you've done for them. You just received Jesus as your Savior. Write to me. Tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. Next week, we'll continue learning from the sayings of Jesus. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.